Welcome back to those of you who were here last week. And welcome to those of you who are new here tonight. Um, welcome to, this is the transition booster session number two. Uh, writing quality transition IEP goals. My name is Amy Clausen. I work for the Ohio Family to Family Health Information Centers. And on behalf of the planning committee, I would like to thank the Eisner Gohn Group for being one of our premier sponsors of the booster sessions this year. It's a huge support to you and all of us in the community to have their support. So we encourage you tonight and in the future to take advantage of the information. We especially hope that you ask a lot of questions of the presenters and of all of us here on the planning committee. And for now, I want to introduce Nessa Siegel, who's going to say a few words. Carrie and I go back a long way. <laughs> I hate to say how long, but a long way. And I've known her for many years, and I, too, am looking forward to her um, speaking tonight. She'll give you a lot of wonderful information. Carrie's devoted her legal practice to the representation of individuals with disabilities. With a primary focus in special education, she has assisted students with a wide variety of diagnoses in ensuring that their needs are met in Ohio's public schools. She has represented individuals in eligibility and IEP meetings, administrative reviews, resolution sessions, and in front of state and government agencies for both IDEA and Section 504 complaints. She has represented individuals in due process hearings, state level reviews, and of course in federal court. She welcomes and enjoys speaking to parents group and teaching continuing legal education, education classes as these matters at both the local and national levels. As an adjunct professor, she co-taught disability disability law at Case Western Reserve. She has also represented parent groups bringing successful complaints regarding systemic issues to Ohio Department of Education. She has co-counseled with juvenile and domestic relation cases um, serving children with special needs. She has repeatedly been named to the top 2.5 percent of Ohio's young attorneys and was profiled in Ohio Super Lawyers uh, Rising Stars Edition. Carrie was a principal partner in the firm of Siegel and Hagen, and at that time we received um, U.S. News and World's Report as the top law firm award for 2011, 12, and 13. My pleasure to give you here. Thank you. You know, what Nessa didn't tell you is that we've... Um, We've known each other since I was a law student. And I came to her office one day in desperate need of a job, clerking, and she was in desperate need of help. <laughs> and um, she gave me a job that day, and uh, we worked together until she retired, and uh, we miss her. Um, and I'm glad that she still has a presence in special education, so thank you. Um, transition planning. Transition planning is some of the most difficult planning that we do for our children because we just finished learning one system, right? You kind of start to feel a little comfortable by the time you get into middle school with that IEP. And then they add a whole new component with a lot of new rules and a lot of new agencies. And they all have their own rules and their own forms and their own procedures. And so there's yet another learning curve that we get to face. And I know that Nessa spoke last week about some of the law associated with transition planning. What I really want to do this week is get into the nitty gritty about how it works and how we get that document to perform in a way that we need it to perform to be successful for our kids. Um, in looking at transition planning, what we're really talking about is making sure that our kids, once they turn 14, are receiving services that move them forward, that move them toward adulthood, that move them toward real world outcome oriented 
um, goals. Education isn't about just moving kids from grade to grade. Education is about ensuring that students become self-sufficient and independent to the greatest extent possible for them. And when we look at IDEA, the last time it came up to Congress for reauthorization, that became one of the express purposes of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It was to make sure that students become as self-sufficient and independent as possible. Case law in federal courts says the same thing. So there was a case called the Olmstead case. And that case was fought primarily to enable people to live in their communities, people with disabilities, to live in their communities and to not be living in um, retirement communities or nursing homes if they need support. Olmstead said, no, we need to bring people with disabilities into our communities, living in homes, living in group home environments, in our neighborhoods, because that's where they should be. And it seems like such an easy question. Why, why is that something that we would ever even have to talk about? Of course, that's what the default should be. But we actually have to put policies in place to make sure that people with disabilities have equal access to live in their community. And now we're applying that case to say, people with disabilities should also have the opportunity to work in their community and to work meaningfully in their community for equal pay and not relegated to employment opportunities that are only provided in shelter or enclave situations. That being said, there are some people with disabilities that require that level of support in order to be successful in an employment setting. So what we want to do as we talk about this process is remember every decision stays individual. But we have preferences for least restrictive environment, meaning we have preferences to be, in li to be living in the community, to be fully employed in a competitive work opportunity, and to be receiving post-secondary education to the extent needed to meet our goals.